Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming to uh, see our presentation. Um, my name's Rob Havard, um, owner operator at Feps and Angus in um, in Worcestershire. We farm about a thousand acres, uh, running um, Pedigree Aberdeen Angus. We also contract farm on the Kemerton Estate with uh, the Kemerton Red Pole herd. Um, and we focus on uh, fertility on the maternal uh, traits. Um, and joining me today is Sarah Dusgate, who works uh, here as well, and she's um, she leads on all the work over at Kemerton, but also helps out with all the Angus stuff, and um, you know, is a great asset to our team as well. And she'll be talking a little bit uh, later on through the presentation. Um, so if we just start off um, where we are in the industry at the moment, um, too much bull. Uh, it's all we see, you know, when you get the, the semen catalogues and you get um, everything coming through uh, the post, everything's all about the bull. Um, and, and the question mark really is in terms of on your operation, on your farm, what does the bull actually do for you? And, and in reality, it is, a, it is the bull is just a vessel for passing on the genetics. Um, and those can either be terminal in terms of trying to get a terminal impact on a calf to sell uh, a marketable calf um, or in terms of the maternal and in which case the bull is purely there to pass on the female genes um, to widen that into the gene pool of the, of the females that you want so really what that's what the bull does um, you know in, a, in an efficient system probably should be working for 45 to 60 days uh, of the year uh, and not doing an awful lot the rest of the year and then if we look at what the cow does for us it carries a calf for nine months in utero um, it's got to get in calf first uh, while it's um, while it's suckling a calf and it's feeding that calf in our system for 10 months um, and it's carrying the other calf at the same time. And, um, you, you know, she is the, the physiological centre of production on your farm. Um, so really, she's a, a massive part of what's going on. She's the receptor interpreter of all the environmental signals that come onto your farm. Uh, that she's taking forward and that that impacts the future generations and so in terms of the impact of the male versus the female just from the work they do um, you know you can see see a pattern emerging here where the the female does all the work but the bull the male gets all the credit and maybe we've seen that somewhere before um, so maybe we should be bringing the spotlight a bit more onto the cow maybe she should be the star of the show that's uh, one of our most feminine cows that we have here. Um, she's structurally ideal. We'll go into some of the structure that we look for a little bit later on. Um, but as we move through, through the, uh, the presentation, sorry, I've gone too far there. Um, we sort of ask our question, you know, why didn't we focus on the feminine in the past? And what, you know, what's, what's this focus on the, on the bull side of it? And why, why have we gone down that route? Um, an often heard phrase that I, I heard growing up uh, from father and other breeders and pedigree breeders who are friends with uh, my father and grandfather who are pedigree breeders themselves. Um, the bull is half your herd. Um, well, I think so with, with our modern day understanding, we can question whether that how accurate that really is. And a lot of this stems from the Mendelian um, pairs. Um, so the Mendel's law, law of segregation, which you might remember doing Mendel's P's in GCSE biology at school. But the, basically the, essential, the, the, the fact that you've got the base pairs of the chromosomes that um, are matched and 50% comes from the male and 50% comes from the female. Uh, and then if we think about a management system, you know, if the bull covers 30 cows and the assumption was that 50% of the relative genetic information was from one individual the bull and the remaining 50% was split between the 30 individual cows so in terms of the impact of an individual animal to move your herd forward you can see why people focused on the bull side rather than the the female side um, and the focus on this when you know there was the the, the the inset of genomic technology and assessment of the genetic merit of different animals as we started understanding what different genes were and, and you know attributing traits to those genes and and making this bit uh, management decisions geneticists and scientists involved in animal breeding kind of abandoned the importance of cow families um, in selection and, and the cow family was 
a mainstay and, and still is to a, to a degree with farmers and breeders. But on the science side, it was seen as kind of a, an obsolete viewpoint that didn't really um, relate to the actual science. Um, but I think what we can see with the developments in genetics has actually has moved on that, you know, maybe that wasn't quite correct. Um, you know, because there are other things that are impacting other than just just the pure genes. Um, if we look at something called epigenetics, the definition of epigenetics is the, the Greek word epi means above or over. And the, so it's above genetics, the impact in, in addition to, if you like, the genetics. And that's, or in addition to the genes, if you like. Um, and the pure scientific definition might be changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So you have little switches that turn on and off different genes and, and whether or not things are turned on or off can have an impact on how that cell, how that you know, will, will behave. Um, and if we go down to the purest form of, of epigenetics in terms of the sort of the, the end point for a cell, what it's going to become. So in utero, when you've just got the embryo, then you've got a collection of cells called the blastocyst. Those cells are more or less identical. There's difference between them, but, you know, more or less identical. And they have the same genetic code within each of them within the nucleus. But the thing is, some of those cells are going to end up being bone cells. Some of them are going to be, it might be, you know, within the eye or a brain cell, or they might be bone marrow or a liver or an intestine. So despite them having the same genetic code, whether which which genes are actually turned on and off is going to de determine what that cell becomes and then how it behaves it's, you know so, so it's a huge has a huge impact this epigenetics over and above what the actual um, genetic code is itself and we've focused on the genetic code almost to the exclusion of epigenetics in in um, in selection of animals for a long time now um, and if you look at humans you can see that uh, not only in utero, but actually within lifetime, you know, alcohol adaption, I'm sure over Christmas, um, perhaps many of us have overindulged, uh, you know, and, and as we've taken our, on more alcohol through the uh, through the Christmas period, you know, as the week's gone on, um, we've taken that environmental information or our liver has, uh, and actually the cells in the liver will, will actually change what they're doing as part of that epigenetic um, reaction to the change in environment so we start producing enzymes that help us break down the alcohol a bit more uh, perhaps it means we don't get such a hangover the next day and we get a little bit more tolerant we've got to have an extra an extra can to have the same impact and that's an adaptation that can happen quite in quite a small change just because the environment's changed slightly and that's switched on a different gene to change something that's happening so that's in environmental Adaption. We see that in cattle, for example, if you move cattle from, from one area to another, uh, you see the hide thickness. So if you move them from, say, middle America up into Canada, where the temperatures are much, much colder, over the course of three or four years, within the lifetime, the, the genetic expression will change because the different genes are turned on or off, and you can actually get a thicker hide develop over time. Um, that also happens across generations so in order to trigger some of these switches it might take three generations or more of environmental input in order to switch those genes on and then it might be similar to switch them off so actually you've got this really interesting situation where the the genetic history and the experience of the environment that the animal's been through over a long period of time is actually recorded within the genes itself um, and Ultimately, we're looking for animals that fit their environment, that have genetic fitness. And so, you know, the energy requirements are absolutely key to that. And that metabolic efficiency within the environment is absolutely key. And the genetic family history that stands behind each animal, the lineage that you have, that's actually, you know, that's genetic information. It's, it's like the family story that's been passed down, the experiences, and hopefully provide information to the body to actually change and, and react to what's coming. You know what's coming and so it's not just about these genes that we focused on in breeding in the past it's also about the environmental input over many generations onto a population of animals um, something else that we need to look at in terms of looking on the cow side is 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 the, the function of mitochondria 
um, within the body and within the cell itself. So the mitochondria are very important because they, they take the food sources that are coming into the body through the bloodstream, and they turn that into a chem chemical energy, into ATP that cells can use for the function of each cell, whether that's an eyeball or a, or a cell in the heart or whatever. Each of them is using energy and it has to use ATP to do that. And so they have a very important job. Um, the metabolism, you know, they regulate the, the cellular metabolism and obviously the regulation of metabolism of, you know, in terms of how much energy an animal's using is absolutely key in terms of its energy requirements. And that has an impact on all the other functions that the animal has. It's how much spare energy is around. So a very important thing. It also has a, a big impact on cell death. So when when an animal uh, or a human or, you know, whatever in, encounters an environmental stress, that might lead to something that could kill off cells um, through um, oxidative stress or whatever. And that that impact can actually be um, sort of stabilized through the mitochondria reacting to that and producing an enzyme, um, a peptide, amino acid that can actually help um, prevent some of that cell death. So it regulates that part of it. And so, you know, our reaction to environmental stresses and the, the cattle's reaction to environmental stresses are, are are managed by the mitochondria they also manage particularly in the in the gonads and in the brain and in other places the mitochondria in those cells in the production of steroid hormones they actually regulate that as well um, and all of these things are really important in terms of the management and the reaction of the animal to the environment um, but the mitochondria have dna that code for this have some some special qualities um, that help animals adapt now one of those is a higher rate of genetic mutation and that leads to faster rates of adaptation um, it can also lead to genetic diseases and genetic problems as a result of that but um, th you know that's obviously an advantage if it's if it's one of the areas that's receiving the the uh, information the data almost from the environmental uh, impact on the animal that then it's able to change faster if it's if it needs to. But one of the key things to take away about the function of mitochondria is that of, of the mitochondrial DNA that's passed into the offspring, 99% comes from the female. So nearly all, I mean, in all intents and purposes, basically all the relevant information for the mitochondrial DNA comes from the female. And this is something that we exclude when we think about the impact of selection, where we're looking at the male perhaps rather than the female. And so we, we kind of re, really need to reassess. If we think about what we we're just talking about in terms of energy reg, regulation, uh, regulating me metabolic efficiency in terms of hormone balance and hormone um, genesis, that is really important. And, and the, so the feminine inheritance, you know, with what we know now, we probably need to have a look at that. You know, so it looks like cow families are back and the shared history of those cows and the ancestry of those cows is everything in terms of um, you know, that information that gets passed on into the next generation. And if we're not careful, we exclude that when we, where we take the animal away from its natural environment and we provide loads of additional environment. Um, we, you know, all of these things can have unintended consequences. And so that really summarizes that, it, you know, some of our assumptions about why we chose uh, focusing on the male impact um, from previous known science, things have changed. And we now know that absolutely, if we're producing animals within their environment, then the cow is the most important thing and that the genetic history of that cow is absolutely key. And we need to focus on those maternal traits in order to make a profit. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll just go on to, uh, we'll move on to Sarah and she's gonna talk about the economic impacts of, um, of focusing on maternal traits and how they can improve welfare and profitability in the herd. Thanks Rob. Have you got that Sarah? Yeah, I've got that. Cool, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to jump back a bit and just give a bit of an overview of why fertility is important in suckler herds in the UK and beef farms. So the three documents I've got at the bottom here, we've got a document from AHDB on feeding suckler cows, um, a recent Nuffield report from Sarah Pick on heifer replacement strategies, and a book by Jan Bonsmer on livestock production. So there's a lot on um, selected maternal traits in that book that Rob's going to go into a bit later. Um, but something that all three of those documents and books agree on is that fertility is the key metric for profit in suckler herds, not growth or muscle in. 
So that means the profitability of a suckler herd revolves around our cows producing a calf during a compact calving period every year. So the goal for our business and for suckler herds is to produce long lived fertile cattle that pay the bills so we can keep doing what we do. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Um, so the industry target, and this has been set for a few years now, is that we should be carving our heifers at two years old with a carving interval of 365 days. So this means we want that first calf out of those heifers at two years old, and then she needs to be having another calf every year after that. Um, carving heifers older than this starts to increase our heifer rearing costs. And if we carve at two years old, we can increase the number of calves per cow over her lifetime. And if we also select for longevity in our cows, we can increase that. So we're going to get more and more calves um, so under those photos there. Um, so a tight carving block is what we also want so that we get a uniform crop of calves in terms of their weight. So the two photos we've got here are from last year. This is one of our heifers, Feps and Poppy. So on the left, she's 11 months old. She was weaned in March 2020. Um, ran with the bull August, September, and then photo on the right, December 2020. So she's three months in calf here. So you can see that in that eight month difference between those photos, how much capacity she's developed, big room and capacity there, three months in calf. And you can really see that she's starting to mature. So with the right genetics and management and nutrition, you really can get the cattle ready um, to carve at two years old. So she's solely forage-based diet there and outwintered. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so I think what's worth noting is that um, with that target in mind of carving at two years old, if we look back over some data from BCMS, so this is 2019 data from beef farms in Wales. So this revealed an average carving interval of 426 days. So this is actually 61 days over the 365 day target. Um, and the average age at first carving was almost a year over the target of two years old. It's also noting that this is an average. So there's going to be some herds that are going to be carving quite a bit older than 34 months old as well. Um, what's really interesting though is actually both of these figures have increased from the 2018 data. So what's causing this poor fertility in herds and why is it getting worse? As an industry, are we starting to focus too much on growth and muscle in and losing these maternal traits? And when we know that fertility is this key metric for profit, we really can't be um, losing these maternal traits at the cost of pushing for more growth. So we need to be focusing more on the value of the whole calf crop and not just individual calf values. Next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so what is the true cost? and the reality of pushing for these increased birth weights and growth rates. So on the left, we've got um, continental type um, calf here. And the, often the reality of carving um, these types of cattle requires human intervention, whether that's the farmer with ropes and a carving jack or having to call the vet out for a cesarean. So we haven't just got the financial implications of this type of management with the increased costs of vet med bills and labor the equipment required to carve cows like this. Um, but there's some interesting data about how this affects subsequent breeding seasons for these cows. So um, human intervention will often damage the uterus, which is gonna take a longer to come back cycling to longer to get back in calf. So we're gonna increase that calving interval. Um, these calves are often slow to get to their feet. Um, so often won't be up drinking that colostrum quickly on their own. So often require tubing as well um, to get that colostrum in in the first couple of hours. So again, we've got increased labor um, and there'll often be ongoing costs of supplementary creep feed and carbs to hit these um, high growth weights. <coughs> it's also worth noting that, is this morally acceptable that we continue to make breeding decision, decisions to put animals through this intervention when in, the, in nature, some of these calves just simply wouldn't survive. So if we look at focusing on the whole calf crop, it starts to make us um, look at managing more efficiently. So there's some targets for Australian beef herds now of having 3000 animals per labor unit. And in the kind of system on the left here, we just wouldn't be able to achieve that kind of efficiency around carving. 
um, if we managed like we continue to on the left. So what we want, if we focus on the whole calf crop, is a cow that can carve naturally on her own, calf quick to their feet quickly, up drinking colostrum quickly on their own um, in a low maintenance system. Okay, um, so if we run through a quick example, so if in the UK, if we're getting weaning percentages of around 85%, whereas if we look at some of the top farms in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, that are getting weaning percentages of around 95%, if we look at um, 100 cow herd, that 95% weaning is gonna get an extra 10 calves per 100 cows. So if we're weaning at 300 kilos, those extra 10 calves are gonna to equate to 3000 kilos. So you have to increase your average weight by more than 35 kilos per head to get that same level of production. But as discussed, um, pushing for that increased growth, weight, growth rate has unintended consequences of reducing fertility and subsequent profitability. So if we're selling stores at 18 months at a thousand pounds per head, those extra 10 calves, if we can get that 95% weaning target, is going to equate to an extra 10 grand into the business. Okay, next slide. So for us, um, carving is one of the busiest times of the year. I think a lot of businesses will agree. So we also want to reduce this carving period to reduce our costs, particularly labour. We also want to hit a tight carving interval so that we get a uniform crop of calves. Next slide. So if we push for increased growth rates, it's likely to reduce these maternal traits, which Rob will go on to a bit more later, um, and it's going to extend that carving period. So if you're carving of three months and over, if you've got a carving season of three months and over, it means the youngest calves are going to be 90 days behind the oldest, which will often mean around 100 kilos difference already. So the benefits of rearing those slightly heavier calves if we're pushing for increased growth rates are often outweighed by the time it takes to get them there when the carving block is so much longer. So this is really important when um, we're considering rearing our heifer replacements as well. So we want a really tight cohort of um, heifer calves. So if we've got a heifer calf that's born three months behind the first heifer calf, she's got a lot of catching up to do. So um, that oldest heifer calf, if she's going to the bull at 12 months old, that means the youngest heifer calf is going to be going to the bull at nine months old. So she's got to be in the right condition for bulling at nine months old, which is going to be quite a challenge. Um, if she does manage to get in calf, she's then going to be having to carve at 21 months instead of 24 months, which is um, uh, going to be really difficult. So um, focusing on that, those maternal traits to really hit that fertility um, is really key in heifer replacements as well. And I'll move back on to Rob's slide. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, and so as we can see, the economic impact um, of, um, of not focusing on fertility is pretty big. And, and, and as Sarah said, fertility is the number one profit predictor uh, in suckler cow businesses. So. If we're going to select for fertility, we really need to understand what it is. And this is something that sort of um, almost confused me, if you like, um, over time. One of the things that we try and do is manage the cattle as naturally as possible and, and to think about what, um, you know, what does that mean? And, and what does that mean in terms of having a focus on fertility to try and get to, say, a 95 percent weaning weight? And the reality is that that you tend not to see that kind of, those kinds of fertility rates in 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 nature. And if you look at wild red deer populations, um, you'll often see an awful lot less uh, than than ninety five uh, wean per per hundred. You know, and so you know exactly what's going on here. And if we're trying to uh, select for it, we need to understand the evolution, the adaptation behind the selection on fertility. And I recommend looking at some of the work of Heather Haying and Brett Weinstein have done a lot of work on um, evolutionary biology, uh, the well-known evolutionary biologists. And um, There's a quote here, I'll read it out, but um, adaptive evolution improves the fit of creatures to their environment. In a rush to make evolutionary biology and empirical science, though, we biologists settled on a definition that was easily measured. And that's something we'll come back to that science tends to do. Um, that fitness and reproductive success were near synonyms, so they're effectively treated as the same thing. 
However, if an individual animal produces many offspring, all of which die in the winter, we're likely come to understand that it failed in an evolutionary sense. So we can see here that fertility is an energy cost to the animal, that it has to balance with its other considerations in terms of survival. Um, and I think personally, if you look at this, that there is an inherent fertility in wild populations. There is a, there's something I think we could call it adaptive fertility. Um, and that, that means that it's absolutely hardwired into these animals that the, their, their fertility rate is gonna be relate, in relationship to the available resources in any year and in the, you know, in the preceding year coming up to the point of conception. Uh, and if we look at the research on uh, on fertility, nearly all the research says that fertility is not actually very heritable, which means that we can't have an enormous impact on on that. Um, but it says that it, it is very highly linked to body condition. And so that's obviously something we can manage. We can manage body condition either by providing more environment or by having an animal that fits that actually fits the environment itself. Um, and another quote here, I think this is important stuff, so just forgive me for, for going through this. Um, again, from, from Heather Haig and Brett Weinstein. Um, adaptive evolution occurs as individuals compete for resources. Each individual is the beginning of a line of descent, and the period over which its descendants persist is a good proxy for fitness. This is where we must break our sense of obligation to measure things. Uh, ad adaptive evolution, the process that increases the fit of animals to the environment, is about all levels of descent at once. Adaptive evolution is therefore fractal and the term that encapsulates that is lineage. This is really important um, that essentially it's not just, you know, as if we just think about those Mendelian pairs we spoke about at the start, uh, it's not just the inherited genetic code it's the inherited genetic experience of previous generations um, and one of the things that they say is that that this this is we should look at the lineages at the something that we look at, at all at the same time it's not you know and, and there's it's also weighted for how recent that genetic experience is and which genes have been turned on and off in the epigenetic sense that we've talked about earlier and with what we know now about the importance of female inheritance and mitochondrial dna you know what does that mean for our breeding strategy and, and for us it means um, certainly selecting through our females so we select our males through our females that it'll be the the sons of the cows that we love are the ones that go on to breed within our herd and we take that forward um, on and on it's not going to be selecting the the biggest the most muscular type we're looking for things that are correct uh, we'd we'll be looking for things that are problem free as well. These are really important considerations. But in terms of fertility, we need to be looking at the cow and her fit to the environment. So we, if we accept that adaptive fertility is a reality and that inherent fertility, which I know Bonsma talked about and, and Jan Bonsma will talk about that in a little bit. Um, other people, uh, Johann Zeitzman, some of you will have come across was also talked about selecting for inherent fertility, but we have to decide whether that really is desirable. Because if an animal breeds despite the available resources, um, then that means over time, uh, that animal is going to just, is not gonna have enough resources to, to keep getting in calf and to keep raising a calf. It's just gonna get so poor that it's just, it's just not gonna work. Um, but I think that's a hardwired, and, and I think the evidence of the research shows this, that actually I don't think we can get away from the fact that the fertility is inherently linked to um, the available resources and therefore but the body condition is a good proxy for that. So in terms of what we've got to do then, we have to breed animals that find the energy cost of reproductive success easy. Essentially, it's a walk in the park. It's well within the boundaries of the available, uh, of the available environment. You know, seasons change you know we we've certainly in our herd we had uh, the heifer that sarah showed earlier you know she was part of a heifer cohort that was 100 percent in calf um and 90 percent of those were first cycle breeders you know we couldn't ask for better for an outwintered herd on rough grazing 
um, you know, without a lot of environment, you know, you know, I thought we absolutely we cracked it. And so we put more pressure on the on the um, on the heifers. We didn't do the same heifer development. We didn't move them as often. We made them clear up areas, um, you know, and then and, and the cold spring came in. We had much lower um, uh, success on the fertility on the following year's calf crop, even though it was pretty much genetically identical and bred exactly the same way. The genetics haven't changed, but the available resources and the information going to those animals did change. And we know the ones that bred, um, you know, they're the ones that had were able to cope within the environment, within those environmental pressures. We put more pressure on and, and they were still able to cope and their body had made that decision that, you know, that was OK. Um, and so that means we need animals with a low energy requirement for maintenance, but with plenty of energy left for reproduction. And, you know, and if through our management, uh, we manage to increase the amount of available resources through better grazing management, so we've got more grass or we've got better quality grass, then the key thing there, I think, is rather than then start for selecting for greater growth individually within the animals, so more production individually, we just keep more of the animals. We just keep more of them to maintain the same pressure and, you know, any production benefits we can put into the system. We then we just we just eat that up with additional stocking rate, and then if you know the environment goes the other way and we have a cold spell or we have a climate change that makes things colder or makes you know things warmer, which means we don't have the same um, availability of forage in the summer or something like that, then the, we've still got the animal. We haven't created some energy intensive animals that are going to become less fertile in the future. And in terms of meeting market requirements. We can always get that from the terminal line with an easy carving terminal line to meet market demand to provide a calf, which just wouldn't keep replacements from those terminal animals. So we can see that selecting for these profitable traits and these more humane traits in, in cattle and see the benefits of those, the different ways you can do it. Clearly, we can do it from monitoring and selection. So we can we can look at we can see which animals breed. And then we can see which animals breed back year after year within a system. But really and truly, you're not going to know about a cow until she is, you know, at least six or seven years old um, to know whether she's, you know, she's got everything you're looking for in, a, in an animal. And so there's a time element to waiting to see whether this this can work for you. Um, Jan Bonsma is a legendary cattle scientist who, who looked at an awful lot of, of cattle. I think he looked at about um the research background i think it was uh, i may have got this wrong but i think it was stellenbosch university um and he would look, looked at forty thousand cows looked at the breeding record of, record of each one and then looked at physiological cues the physical assessment to see you know what were the uh, physical the sort of phenotypic traits they had that gave you a clue as their as to their fertility he went over to the states and um, did an assessment on over a, a thousand cows and just by looking at their physical appearance of the cows he, he stated what the breeding record was of each and every cow and was incredibly accurate with what he did and so whilst some of this is anecdotal it has been shown to work in practice and one of his key things he wanted to do was to to give a physical assessment of a cow for fertility for a practical farmer who could go when they're going to buy some animals when they're selecting their heifer replacements you know how this works i mean that for us this you know this works well for me in terms of you know one of the reasons i really love um or one of the other reasons i really love selling um um straws of semen from one of our bulls is that i know everything about him um and if other people pedigree breeders are using him over their cows and then we'll get some heifers they'll get some heifers from them when i go to select you know i'll, I'll revisit that breeder and hopefully buy some replacements back from them because i know everything about the male side and then i can do a visual assessment on those heifers that have come through see which ones i think i want to choose um to buy back off them that's providing a market to them but it's also giving me a bigger genetic base to go out in terms of picking those females that are going to work so uh, not only looking at the physical cues, but Jan Bonsler, we've talked a bit about this already, but the total environment that the cow has to, uh, has to stand. So quite often we talk just about nutrition because, of course, we can feed an animal into fertility, but that's going to cost us money. But there are other environmental factors that are having a big impact, whether that's temperature through the summer or the winter, the levels of light, radiation, altitude, 
barometric pressure, the wind, the disease pressures. We've got ectoparasites on here. You could put endoparasites in there as well. You know, all these differences, the soil pH, the soil fertility, the soil mineralization, all of that sort of stuff all has an impact. And obviously the weather, the rainfall, the humidity as well. All of these things and these can create stresses on the animal, which change whether or not it's got available resources. So we have to be careful where we are selecting our animals. If we're selecting them in a shed or if we're selecting them doing feed efficiency trials, in a, you know, where they're getting an unlimited amount of feed and we're seeing which ones, okay, some of that less than more and other ones and some have grown. But is that a real environment in terms of the commercial uh, operation of the cows that we're sort of wanting to select for? Might be good for a terminal animal, but I don't think it's got any place in a, in a maternal system. You know, and in many ways in our systems, you know, suckler cow production systems are not that profitable. Um, if you look at you know recent figures over the last few years that you know the average is that suckler cow operations don't make any money at all they lose a fair bit of money every year and so the more cost we can cut out of that the better and the more resilient we're going to be as a business now there are a lot of ways where we're providing more environment uh, in order to to prevent these stresses from impacting the animals because otherwise they're going to lose fertility and body condition and they're not going to breed back and we're going to have problems in our herds so providing hard feed or high energy feed, there's a cost there. You know, the energy cost of intensive forage lays, kale, roots, putting those in, do they succeed? The genuine, if you really look at the genuine cost of the odd failed establishment and, and the management cost of that. And, and when we look at the cost of per kilo, we, all, we often don't consider the fact that if we'd done nothing and we'd stockpiled some forage, um, you, you know, we are, the costs are of those addition. It's only the the benefit is on the additional kilos of dry matter that we're we're producing, rather than the total kilos of dry matter that we get as part of those um, those those intensive crops. We provide minerals. We still always provide minerals. I think that's an important one, but it is is just good to understand that that's there. Um, providing wormers. So we haven't wormed any of our Angus cattle for five years now um, so they're selecting under that pressure they have to get in calf and, and, and manage those situations and obviously in a lot of operations and a lot of businesses um, are probably more on the dairy side but the prophylactic medication whether that's vaccines or whether it's antibiotics in certain situations um, you know weaning early has a huge cost you know if you wean in um, just before winter then you've got to house all those calves You've got to house them separately. You know, all our calves are still on the mothers. They're outside. Uh, they only need a little bit of hay, a little bit of rough grass to go with the milk and they'll be growing absolutely fine. That's the best way to and cheapest way to winter a calf. So, you know, you're adding costs by weaning early and you're also giving your cow an easy time as well. Um, and so you're not providing that environmental pressure that she should be able to operate under. And obviously housing animals, it's the same sort of thing. And you know, and if we look at some of our modern methods of, of, um, of selection, you know, we talked about, there's a great quote for the Heather Haying and Brett Weinstein about, you know, we're going to have to abandon our need to choose something to measure because, you know, if we look back in history about, you know, when we were selecting for, when we were looking at what equated to um, environmental fitness, we, we looked at it and thought, well, that was a reproductive success. But actually, that was a simplification of the situation because persistence is actually uh, genetic persistence is more important than reproductive success. But similarly, it's easy for us to have unintended consequences when we select the measurement of, of what we're doing. And if you look at something like, you know, we select and measure eye muscle in animals, well, that's antagonistic to a trait of easy carving. So that if you have greater, larger eye muscles, you going to have more carving difficulty and the research is fairly clear on that and if we're selecting for additional weaning weight or weaning percentages as a percentage of the cow's weight are we selecting for additional growth rate are we selecting for additional milk in the mother and is that giving us environmental sorry is that giving us energy requirements that maybe we you know we don't, that's going to cost us in the long run if we keep selecting in that way you know, what is it? What are we selecting for when we're selecting for growth rate? You know, growth rate is many things and it's it's essentially regulated by the hormone balance when we're selecting for growth um, and the growth, the balance between your growth hormones and your reproductive hormones. So you start messing with the hormone balance in an animal and that's going to affect the fertility. 
So we think we, you know, growth rate could also mean additional bone. It could be, could mean additional frame. It's not just muscle and meat. So you start adding all these traits in. You, what are we really selecting for? You know, the feed efficiency trials. I think they're very interesting. So you're looking at rumen efficiency, um, but are you looking? Are you selecting for hormone? levels in terms of growing an animal that grows more are you selecting for for rumen efficiency are you selecting for metabolic efficiency so it's you know the, the in terms of those the organ the main organs and um so you've got the the heart and the lungs and so it's metabolic re resting metabolic rate is low so its energy requirements are low so it's able to convert more feed because it's using less energy so there's so many things here we can't be certain about what what it is we're actually selecting for uh, Marbling is a popular one at the moment, um, but we also know that in a, in a hormonally balanced bull, um, they're actually going to be higher in testosterone and the testosterone is going to mean they're going to have leaner meat. So we start selecting for, for more marbling in the meat than we have. And my, my opinion is we've got plenty of marbling in all our native breeds. So we don't need any more. We have the perfect amount already. If you haven't messed that up by selecting for too much um, muscle bulk. Um, and then you've got the problems of pairing antagonistic traits. So, you know, if we select for growth rate and calving ease, we saw the consequences of that in, in a few breeds where you ended up having easily born calves with narrow hips. And those narrow hipped heifer calves then grew up to have, hef have calving difficulty. So you've got, you know, antagonistic traits that actually selecting for calving ease ended up producing calving problems. Um, you know, if you select for growth rate and gestation length, then, you, you know, we started having problems, you know, um, in the industry of having um, sort of calves born before time, uh, premature births. And, and so if you're not careful, you know, be careful what you select for, because you might just get it. And if you haven't thought about it carefully, um, you can go down the wrong road and all of these things can end up costing you money. Um, if we look in terms of the the clues that we're looking for in terms of the functional efficiency of a cow if we're looking for the fertility of a cow um, huge importance on that hormone and we talked about the balance of growth hormones and, and reproductive hormones essentially as the long bones grow when the reproductive hormones dominate uh, the, the growth hormones the growth plates at the end of the long bones close and then stops growing and the secondary reproductive characteristics sexual characteristics start coming into the fore, so the development of the feminine, uh, of the udder, of the hip structure on the female and the bulls, you get that thoracic extension and, and you know, you get that, that neck and, and, the, and the crest on the back of the bull's neck, you start to see that the impact of those hormones. And if we mess with selecting for growth rate, which is essentially selecting for growth hormones, then we're going to be messing with that hormone balance. Here's an art example from Bonsma, where the top one, you can see a steer that's castrated at uh, six months. Um, and then you've got a steer castrated at two years, looking a little bit more masculine. And then you've got an uh, intact bull at the bottom. And what you can see is significantly different um, physiological and, and skeletal development, depending on the hormone production that's happened in the animal throughout its life. So we can absolutely see from our interventions that there's a clear impact of, of the hormones on, on the skeleton. And this is something that Bonsma pointed out. And so if he's going to actually try and find ways to um, identify what a fertile animal is, you can look at these cues to find which animals have the hormone balance. So if we look at the females here, so the um, Jersey cows, so the Jersey cow at the bottom is the feminine cow. Um, you can just see that feminine neck. You can see a crest on the neck of the cow at the top. The amount of pedigree female cattle that I see that have a crest is just incredibly disturbing. You know, this is an, these are animals with terrible um, physiological cues for fertility. Um, I, I understand that they're very, very terminal animals, many of them, uh, but the problem is they often get marketed as being terminal and maternal, like you can have it all. And I think, unfortunately, you can't have it all. You can also see a slope, a uh, lovely slope on the shoulder and a prominent shoulder there as well. We'll look at that more. Perfect udder is often a sign of fertility as well, a symmetrical udder. Um, and here we've got some more examples. And again, you know, growing up, I was always taught to let the cow with a with a peg on each corner, the one shaped like a brick, almost selecting for a for a meat type animal in your female. But it, it, it's interesting, actually, because 
you know, when we look at, when we think about that terminal aspect, in the past, it was well understood that you had, you know, like a mule you with a terminal terminal ram, ram on the sh in the sheep world you know it was understood that you had this terminal sire that had job to do and you you perhaps wouldn't keep the replacements from that you'd have a specific hybrid um, that would be your maternal line and then you'd use a terminal on top of that but you can see the difference in the phenotype here and the bottom type is what we're aiming for and this is uh 634 she's one of, we saw her a bit earlier on she's one of the favorites we have here lovely feminine neck and you can see that prominent shoulder which is um, a sign of, of hormone um, balance and the fact that the, the growth hormones weren't overly active she's got a lovely slope from a hook that's the hip um, down to the pin bone by the vulva so that's a downward slope there some people say they don't like a high tail set and I think that's fair enough because a high tail set is often uh, a sign um, that you you won't have the hip slope from hook to pin, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't. But it is correlated when people have done that done that work. So if you see a tight high tail set, it's okay, but you've just got to make sure you've got that hip slope for carving ease. That's important also for draining of fluid from the cervix to the vulva, um, and you have to think about stuff like retained placentas and the things draining properly and obviously carving downhill sounds a lot better than carving uphill um, she's got a perfect udder um, she's you know she's freshly carved there so that's as big as the teats are going to be um, she's got a lovely hind leg and you can probably just make out if you look at her front leg set what you can actually see is despite her really feminine shoulder she's actually got an incredible amount of heart room so the vital organ capacity for a heart and lungs and then room capacity as well she's a lovely wedge shape but that heart and lungs room also obviously gives her an op you know helps with the uh, sort of metabolic efficiency and the, and the metabolic resting rate that she has will be you know she'll have it be easy maintenance cow if you think about steve redgrave or matthew pinson in the rowing they, they had something like i don't know 50 percent higher capacity of lung capacity and that's one of the reasons they were so effective so if we look at the reasons why that prominent shoulder is important, you can see the, the subfertile cow on the left, the chine bones on top of the spine are elongated. So the long bones kept growing. And that meant that um, you just don't see the shoulder rotate above the spine when they're walking along. And that's kind of a minimum standard. Ideally, I'd like a, a prominent shoulder even when they're standing, if possible. But if it rotates above the spine, that can be enough. Um, and then you can see on the right, you can see the shoulders now prominent. You can also see finer bone. And the other thing you'll notice is the length of the humerus and the scapula are longer and that in the, um, on the left and the subfertile cow. And interestingly, that is going, that's going to create a greater angle at the shoulder um, and just you know at the elbow as well and that has an impact on their gait and also on their foot placement so actually this stuff has an impact on lameness in terms of structure so just by selecting for functionally efficient uh for fertile efficient cows you actually help select for structure just by that just by doing that you can sort also see it's finer bone um, on the fertile fertile cow and here's an example of that fertile versus subfertile finer bone um and the impact of that and um, i'm going to show some cows that aren't ours just to um uh so we're not just showing off our own this is a lovely cow at um, the uh, daris meatler the meatler cattle company in america who've been uh, selecting for about 30 odd years um, for functional efficiency fertile efficiency um, and you can see in these again you've got that slope from hook to pin um, is really important in terms of the the, the size of the pelvic op opening. Now, structure is really important here, and this is where I think things can go wrong. And certainly, there are certain breeds who I won't mention that have selected for the size of the pelvic opening, and that's meant they've actually ended up selecting for bigger and bigger cattle. Whereas, actually, if you just select for the slope, you, you get the size of the opening that comes with it without accidentally selecting for greater frame all the time. Here's another one of our cows, perfect udder, nice hip slope. Um, that's going to mean more open space for carving. Um, and again, you can see the hip slope on this one, prominent shoulder. Again, perfect udder with nice tidy teats. This heifer calf, uh, this was born this year. So this is just showing she, she's really coming on. 
lovely broad muscle on the cow as well um you know she's a she's a really nice cow this one she's probably a bit more frame than i'd like but she's doing the job well something else they look at is the escutcheon um so this is the, the space between the back legs and the, the one on the left is the one you're looking at um, that soft velvety so udder like material um, rather than the sort of thicker hide just below the vulva so i think that's an element of flexibility and there's there's also a lot of evidence that you get a higher butter fat content with the uh, if we look at the phenotype on the left rather than on the right there's some of the cows on the hill so this is some cows in wales some, some heifers in wales that went on to breed over there um, and so you know working animals the, the breast pleat is another sign of fertility as well that's something else that bonds were picked up um, and i just go through some animals now so you're getting an idea of this type as we go through you're really starting to see a type of cow that we're aiming for here. That's an absolute beauty, that, that Hereford. Um, these are all Meatler Cattle Company here. They run Herefords and Angus. So we've got this maternal terminal blend, uh, mixing the maternal and the terminal. This is an accident here. You can see the picture on the right. So Wistful, that's the pedigree cow you can see. She, um, she was a bit of a tart. And um, when she was 13 months old, went across four fences to find the blonde bull. Um, she carved that um, on her own at 22 months, um, no problem. So proof of concept of having a proper structure. So at a 22 month small Angus heifer carved a big blonde bull calf, no problem. And she's raising a commercial animal. But for the commercial guy um, or the commercial operator, that is, you know, that's the ideal situation where you've got a very saleable calf that came on its own without any assistance and you've got a cow that will get in calf and carve it on itself every time um, you know um, wouldn't keep the replacements um, and then hopefully use some eternal bulls either of your own or of someone else's to keep breeding that that side of things um, in terms of the modern growth selection as well from the maternal to the maternal so uh, ox and craig kaiser the bull we had collected um, we we had a situation where the collection centre phoned us up to say they were uh, they had they were expecting 150 to 350 straws per jump and Kaiser was Kaiser did 1100 and they did that three more times, um, so incredibly fertile bull but he's the result of older breeding before they went for the high growth selection and I think that pays has an impact for that and some of the older genetics also a shorter gestation lower birth weight um, you know easy carving for dairy herds that sort of thing so it all helps um, to make it work. Final thoughts are for me is, is, you know, focusing on the cow and passing on the female genetics for our suckler herd is key. So the cows are the ones that have the environmental fit, not only their experience within our environment, but actually their ancestors, the female ancestors that's been passed on through the mitochondrial DNA, passed on through the genetics over time. Um, you know, and when people say about visual appraisal, you know, should we be doing that? Should we just select on what works? You know, empty cows should go absolutely um uh, but the visual appraisal appraisal maybe helps you to get there a bit quicker and save a bit of money um, from making wrong decisions you know that's certainly something that we hope you know that's helping us i think as we move forward welfare benefits are absolutely key as sarah mentioned earlier what's our responsibility to these animals it's never been more important for beef sector to have uh, positive sto news stories about it you know these beef systems where you've got multiple cesareans through an animal's life, you know, it might, you know, you might end up, some of them will have two to four calves through cesarean and then that's it, they're culled. And um, I saw on Twitter, someone looking for a crush for cesareans. And I was just thinking, you know, why are you planning for cesareans? Shouldn't you be thinking about that, you know, thinking about how you can avoid having to do that to the poor animal. Um, if you're planning for cesareans, I think that, you know maybe this being popular but i think i think you're doing the wrong thing i don't think that's fair on the animals um and you know seeing someone promote on facebook the other day that they said if a calf born is born un unaided we tend to find it doesn't turn into anything special um, and i think this focus on the individual animal rather than the entire calf crop that sarah explained very well is absolutely key and and you know if we focus on that we'll not only make more money but we'll also have a better welfare situation for the cows on our farm so I think by focusing on fertility, um, there's a huge amount of potential to increase the profit of suckler herds. We need to find a cow that fits the environment. 
Um, and then and it can get in calf and produce a calf every year, like a walk in the park. So it's not stressing, it keeps body condition and we'll have the welfare side covered as well. Um, and just to finish on a slide, that's a picture of old granny, the first Angus cow in the herd book in 18, whenever it was, 87 or something. Um, she was 33 there. Um, and it looked by the look of her, they should have probably killed her a bit earlier, but she had a calf every year until she was 27. So in terms of all this technology and all the cleverness that we have with our genetic assumptions and things we know now, now know we got wrong in the past, how far have we come from the first book in the first cow in the herd book that had 27 calves, um, or sorry, 25 calves without a problem um, in its first 27 years? You know, I don't think we've come very far at all. Um, and it's worth saying, that, you know, that what I hope from this is that we'll get more people selecting for this to improve welfare. We're going to have more animals produced in this way that fit the environment and, and you know, have more profitable farms, therefore, for suckler herds and family farms in this country. And if you're interested in what we do, you can go to our website, which is fepsandangus.com. Um, and if you sign up to our newsletter, you'll also see that um, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll send through the Feps and Angus philosophy of breeding in, in a few weeks. Um, so that you can have a look and see, you know, and a lot of the concepts that we've talked about today will be uh, included in there and you can see what our setup is. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. If you've got any questions, we'll go on to that now for what time we've got. I think we've got one minute, but um, no. there were quite a few questions that came through, but if anyone wants to send them directly to us as well, um, if this shuts off after a minute, that's also fine. If you want, if you want to put, um, contact me on Twitter, uh, Feps and Angus on Twitter, it's at Rob Havard one um, happy to chat any of this, uh, or Facebook also, Feps and Angus is on there, so have a look at that. Um, Gene editing, yeah, don't even look at it. I mean, the genomics data is based on, um, it's just based on flawed data start. So I think we're just heading down a problem over there if we're not careful. Um, I've got a question from Nikki. Here we go. Do you run your heifers and cows together with the bull? Um, we we do some and some. We've trialed running heifers and cows together, uh, keeping the heifers on all through right through so we didn't wean the red pole heifers this year and we're, we're probably going to do similar with the angus heifers this time um so yeah do we uh, do we test for mineral status uh, we don't test but we do give a all-purpose mineral block um and so um that's got s it's sc cattle for rockies we've got slang robots and we're fishing in those and then we obviously we give them that and anything that can perform with that will go um, what does it mean do you do to determine whether cows go to a terminal bull or not? Is it based on the cow's performance or a financial need to sell more stores or both something else? So I would actually just use a, um, a maternal bull for your replacements just to provide you with enough replacements and then everything else. Um, you put that, term, that maternal bull to your best cows, your best maternal cows, and then everything else goes to an easy carving terminal bull as a commercial operator. And that should give you the best return and, and make sure you've got lots of marketable calves. Okay, I've asked about, I've said about minerals. Frankie Guy, what are your thoughts on the role of hybrid veer and replacement selection? Um, I think for the commercial operator, hybrid vigor is uh, a great thing to have. I would want it probably as, as much as anything in the, in the calf that you're going to sell, um, but certainly. Uh, in the female as well, it's not a bad thing. Uh, the only thing is that it's a diminishing, it's the law of diminishing returns on um, hybrid vigor on your cow herd. So I would go for, if you've got, you know, I'm bound to say this, but if you've got a herd you can go to that can provide you with, um, with fertile, with, with genetics for fertility for your replacements, that should provide you with, um, with plenty of fertility in your cow herd and then you determine on everything else. Um, but certainly for the commercial operator, that's really important to have hybrid vigor. And as seed stock producers, as pedigree producers, I think a lot of pedigree producers end up having um, a lot of uh, heterosis within the herd in order to get better growth numbers. But that means then they um, sometimes they're taking that heterosis away from the commercial operator who should be getting those benefits. We should be providing them 
with um, live animals that have a greater uh, hybrid vigor when, when put to your animals. Okay, I think that's all the questions I can see on there for now. Thank you very much.